What is psychoanalytic criticism? Broadly construed, the term psychoanalytic criticism refers to psychoanalytically based approaches to literature and the other arts. Psychoanalytic criticism takes a wide variety of forms, ranging from Bruno Bettelheim's thesis that fairy tales depict stages of psychic development and serve as metaphors for unconscious conflicts to Paul Bloom's description of the anxiety of influence. Sigmund Freud's paper on family romance has been used to formulate a typological study of the novel, whilst his essay on the uncanny has inspired a more thematic approach. All are grounded, or based upon Freud's descriptions of the working of the unconscious, and they usually claim to uncover, or work with material that is not consciously present in the mind of the author or artist in question. It would be erroneous, however, to speak of the psychoanalysis of authors. This is because psychoanalytic criticism is, specifically, an application of Freudian theory, and not an equivalent to a talking cure involving a direct encounter between analyst and analysand. Therefore, psychoanalytic criticism cannot, by definition, have any therapeutic goal or dimension. As we can see, psychoanalytic criticism is a method of critique, or reading that builds on Freudian theories of psychology. Some adherents of this method argue that literary texts, like dreams, express the secret unconscious desires and anxieties of the author. Hence, in psychoanalytic criticism, a literary work is viewed as a manifestation of the author's own neurosis. Freud's writings abound in allusions and references to literature, usually in the form of the German classical tradition, and he believes that the sources of literary creativity in psychoanalysis are similar. Jack Lacan makes a similar point when he remarks of the French novelist, Marguerite Dura, that she knows without me what I teach. Indeed, literary models play an important role in the development of psychoanalysis. The theory of the Oedipus complex originates in Freud's reading of Sophocles and Greek mythology, and his contention that Oedipus Rex encapsulates a universal experience or memory. Yet, Freud is less interested in aesthetics as such than in the psychology and psychopathology of creativity. As he notes, psychoanalysis, therefore, tends to move from the analysis of works of art to the analysis of their creators. Literary examples are often used by Freud to illustrate or confirm his theories. His interest in Jensen's Gradiva, a Pompeian fantasy published in 1905, appears to stem from the fact that it can be read as a study of the return of the repressed, rather than from its intrinsic value as a novel. A similar note is struck when Julia Kristeva suggests that the important thing about Dostoevsky is his ability to illustrate her own views on the dynamics of depression. As we may already know, Freud devotes a number of papers to aesthetic and literary topics. The most important are the study of Dostoevsky, the essays on Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, and the shorter and more general paper on creative writing. In these papers, creative activity is usually described as the adult equivalent to the fantasies of childhood. Friction is seen as providing a form of wish fulfillment, and a pleasurable exploration of imaginary identifications with heroes and heroines. Freud's investigations into creativity make frequent reference to his concept of sublimation. Leonardo's scientific curiosity, for example, is analyzed as a sublimated expression of his childhood curiosity about sexuality, whilst the famous smile of the Mona Lisa is traced back to a childhood fantasy of suckling and passive oral intercourse. The study of Leonardo, which is in fact flawed by Freud's reliance on inaccurate information, provides the prototype for psychobiography, which is the dominant mode of classic psychoanalytic criticism. In Marie Bonaparte's study of Edgar Allan Poe, the tales are grouped into cycles centered on maternal and paternal figures, which are analyzed as though they were the manifest content of the dream. Bonaparte's interpretation of their latent content is then integrated into the known biographical data to produce a psychobiography in which the purloined letter is illustrative or expressive of Poe's nostalgia for the maternal phallus, and of his hatred and fear of his father. There is, thus, 
a tendency to dissolve particular works by individual authors into a universal symbolism. Like Freud before him, Lacan makes frequent use of literary and cultural allusions, often for illustrative or pedagogic purposes. His style is heavily influenced by his youthful association with surrealism, but his use of literature can be surprisingly conventional, and even utilitarian, as when he describes Hamlet as illustrating a decadent form of the Oedipus complex, or when he reads Poe's purloined letter as an allegory of the workings of the signifier. Of course, this paper can also be read as a personal critique of Bonaparte, who was one of Lacan's many enemies. Post-Lacanian psychoanalysis has developed into a highly literate, even literary style of reading and writing, perhaps because so many of those who have turned to Lacan have, especially outside France, backgrounds in the humanities and literary studies. As Lacanian psychoanalysis fuses with Derridean deconstruction and hermeneutics, the traditional divorce between theory and fiction becomes blurred by the emergence of theoretical fictions. The sophistication, and erudition of such studies cannot be denied, but they are surely far removed from Freud's more positivistic ambitions and statements.